Until the election of Ronald Reagan in 1980, presidents of the United States had typically let the agencies of the federal government adjudicate and regulate as they saw fit. That was about to change. President Reagan, elected in 1980, is pictured here alongside University of Chicago professor Milton Friedman, one of the founders of the Chicago School of Law and Economics. In Friedman's view, the proper end of government is material prosperity. Recall from our first meeting that prosperity, or the general welfare it is called, was one of the goals to be pursued under the more perfect union inaugurated by the U.S. Constitution. But so was justice. Social justice, in a broader sense than mere due process, is a treacherous mirage in the view of many of the law and economics persuasion. President Reagan's Executive Order 12291 was without precedent in our history for its ambition and broad sweep. It purported to set prosperity, or maximizing net benefits to society, in the aggregate as the preeminent goal of the federal government. President Reagan deliberately occupied a vast area of Justice Jackson's twilight zone. Notice the qualification to the extent permitted by law to avoid constitutional problems. Where Congress has spoken, it must be obeyed. But where it has not, as it had not, EO 12291 gave the marching orders. The framers themselves had not set priorities among the several goals of the Union. But with one daring flourish of the pen, Ronald Reagan had. None of these three ends is assigned a priority in the text of the Constitution. But President Reagan's executive order elevated national wealth as the dominant default value. The Supreme Court in Chadha wrote in dictum, it is crystal clear from the records of the convention, contemporaneous writings and debates, that the framers ranked other values higher than efficiency. Justice, maybe? And the Constitution vests the legislative power in Congress. It is to the Congress that the framers gave the duty and power to decide how to adjust and balance the purposes for which the Union was formed. The President has the power to veto legislation he or she thinks unwise. But once legislation is law, it is the President's duty to take care that it is faithfully executed. To appreciate just how audacious EO 12291 was, imagine how things might have turned out differently. Imagine Twin Earth Washington, which is just like 1980s Washington, but President Reagan falls under the influence not of Milton Friedman, but of Professor John Rawls of the Harvard Philosophy Department. Rawls's influential 1971 book, A Theory of Justice, rejected the cost-benefit utilitarianism that Friedman embraced and propounded a theory of social justice. Rawls's theory is encapsulated in the principle stated above. All social primary goods, liberty and opportunity, income and wealth, and the social basis of self-respect are to be distributed equally unless an unequal, distribu unequal distribution is to the advantage of the least favored. If we think of society itself as a cooperative enterprise for mutual benefit, then a fair division of the fruits of cooperation must begin with the presumption of equal division. Departures from an equal division are justified if they leave everyone better off, but only to the extent that they do leave everyone better off. Offering greater rewards may be necessary as incentives to get results that benefit all, in which case they aren't unfair. Those who get relatively less are still better off in absolute terms. Because he listens to Rawls rather than Friedman, President Twin Earth Ronald Reagan signs Executive Order 12291 Twin, 
which is just like real-world EO12291, but with the substitutions highlighted above. The goal is to maximize the position of the least advantaged rather than aggregate wealth. This chart illustrates what is at stake. Divide society into two groups, the less advantaged and the more advantaged. We plot the goods received by the less advantaged on the y-axis and the goods gotten by the more advantaged on the x-axis. If social goods were divided equally, the holdings of both groups would fall somewhere on the 45 degree line. Obviously, the farther to the northeast, the better. By going northeast, both groups are better off. Each move to the northeast is efficient in the economist sense, because each leaves nobody worse off and somebody better off. But there's the possibility that there are efficient moves that depart from equality, that is, go off the 45 degree line. Allowing inequality could be an incentive to work harder and produce more, and that can leave everyone better off, even though not all benefit equally. But it is also possible that achieving the maximum total wealth will not only not benefit everyone equally, it might also leave the less well-off worse off. The point at which the red curve reaches, reaches its maximum we call the D point. Clinging closer to equality, the 45 degree line, would make the less advantaged worse off, but straying any farther from the 45 degree line makes them worse off too. The point at which social wealth hits its maximum is the B point, B for Bentham, the British utilitarian. Going farther to the east reduces total wealth because the less advantaged lose more than the more advantaged gain. But between D and B, the more advantaged gain more than the less advantaged lose, and at B, social wealth is maximized. Friedman's advice is to maximize social wealth. That means to drive to B, the Bentham point. Under EO 12291, the overall goal agencies are to pursue is to get society to the B point, which is the point on the red curve where social wealth is at its maximum. A more equal division, near the 45 degree line, would result in less aggregate social wealth. Contrastingly, under Twin Earth, 12, under Twin Earth EO 12291, the overall goal is to reach the D point, which is where the level of well-being enjoyed by the less advantaged reaches its maximum. Going beyond the D point toward B increases the aggregate but reduces the absolute level of the less advantaged. Suppose society has to dispose of some toxic waste. The Milton Friedman approach, encapsulated in EO 12291, tells us to, tells us to dispose of it as cheaply as possible. It doesn't matter that that will probably mean putting it near where the poor live. If it's cheaper to society to dump its waste there, so be it, unless Congress says otherwise, of course. That toxic waste would be handled differently would be under the Rawls approach. It would have to be disposed of in a way that leaves the less advantaged no worse off. That will probably be more expensive, but that's what justice requires on the Rawls view. Other views are possible too. Bizarro Earth is just like our Earth, except that before he became president, Ronald Reagan got to be besties with Ayn Rand, the novelist, when they were both working in Hollywood. On her view, justice means letting the creative people keep everything they create. Anything else is only a form of tyranny of the moochers over the geniuses. The moochers should be grateful that the geniuses are there to create jobs and wealth for them. 
capitalism was her ideal. And when she said capitalism, she meant a full, pure, uncontrolled, unregulated, laissez-faire capitalism with a separation of state and economics in the same way and for the same reasons as the separation of state and church. Milton Friedman was for capitalism because, but only to the extent that, it creates greater aggregate wealth. For Rand, Capitalism is a matter of giving the deserving their due, and any increase in social wealth is only a lucky byproduct. Marking up EO 12291 slightly differently gives us bizarro EO 12291. Regulatory objectives shall be chosen to unshackle the productive geniuses. All, among alternatives, that involving the least interference with the productive geniuses shall be chosen, and priorities shall be set with the aim of celebrating distributive inequalities accruing to the productive geniuses. Inequality is not a mere and maybe regrettable byproduct. It is a sign that the creatives are getting their full due, unhampered by government meddling. In bizarro Washington, there is no meddling in the free market. The geniuses that achieve a monopoly position are not subject to trust busting and mooching. This means allowing society to reach the F point, F for feudal, because the winners keep their full winnings and the rest live at their sufferance. Milton Friedman would say, no, markets are free only if certain conditions are present like the absence of monopolies. Monopolies are a type of market failure because monopolists can restrict output and jack up prices so that overall wealth is less than what it could be. According to Rand's logic, monopolies are prizes that rightfully belong to the winners. Liberty for her trumps the general welfare. Back to real earth in 1990s Washington. Here are President Clinton and Robert Rubin, his Treasury Secretary, late of Goldman Sachs. With Rubin's advice, President Clinton replaced President Reagan's EO 12291 with an updated variant. The language highlighted in yellow would be familiar to Milton Friedman though anathema to Ayn Rand. The language highlighted in green acknowledges that it matters where costs fall. If an agency were guided solely by EO 12866, it might choose not to dispose of toxic wastes in the poor neighborhood, even if it were costlier to put it somewhere else. Note that John Rawls could not approve what Clinton did. Clinton's order tells agencies to treat distributive inequities as a cost, just like any other, but it allows policies that make the worse off still worse off if the aggregate net benefit is great enough. Rawls's so-called difference principle is a principle of reciprocity. Society must forgo aggregate improvements that leave the least advantaged worse off, no matter how great the net gain. That is what it means to treat every citizen as a free equal.